At the age of 26, working as a geriatric nurse, I find myself in a unique and heartwarming situation. The person serving tea across the table isn't my biological mother, but my mother-in-law, the mother of my husband, Russell. Since tying the knot with Russell, I've discovered a second family where warmth and affection are abundant. Unlike my strained relationship with my own parents, I found a surprising kinship with my mother-in-law, who welcomes me with open arms and a bright smile, making me feel closer to her than to my own mother. My mother-in-law, a vibrant and resilient woman, raised Russell and his brother alone after her divorce, instilling in them values and strength. I recall the butterflies in my stomach the first time we met, haunted by a friend's warning that in-laws are puzzles you spend a lifetime trying to solve. However, any trepidation melted away the moment she greeted me, expressing her longing for a daughter in a household of rowdy boys and thanking me for marrying Russell. Her heartfelt welcome made me feel instantly connected to her. She proposed we lay aside formalities and interact as friends, a notion I was initially hesitant to embrace. Yet over time, our relationship blossomed into one filled with laughter, playful banter, and even harmless pranks, often leaving others astonished at the depth of our bond. Although I maintain a level of politeness in larger gatherings, our usual interactions are informal and filled with joy. Russell's job often keeps him away due to shift work and staff shortages, a situation my mother-in-law and I have adapted to with our culinary collaborations and long chats. She openly expresses her delight in my company, sometimes even more so than that of her own son, Russell, which always brings a smile to my face. Our pleasant afternoon was interrupted by a call from Russell, announcing his impending visit to his parents' home. The timing couldn't have been more perfect, as if he sensed the joy and warmth filling the kitchen. This unexpected yet familiar dynamic we've nurtured over time not only highlights the unique bond between a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law la ba, but also showcases the beauty of relationships that defy expectations and societal norms. After a long day at work, I was looking forward to dinner with my mother-in-law when my phone rang. It was Russell, my husband, apologizing for not being able to leave work again. This had become a recurring theme, and although I expressed our disappointment, noting his mother's efforts in preparing dinner for us, he quickly brushed it off, claiming his work obligations took precedence. Before I could respond, he ended the call, leaving me to relay the message to my mother-in-law. Upon hearing Russell wouldn't be joining us again, my mother-in-law sighed, half-jokingly comparing his neglect for family time to her ex-husband's. As we were discussing this, Russell's younger brother Stephen entered, asking us to lower our voices as he could hear us from outside. Stephen, unlike the outgoing Russell, is reserved and lives with their mother, maintaining a somewhat distant demeanor. He acknowledged my greeting with a nod before retreating to his room his cool persona unchanged. Despite the differences between Russell and Stephen and the occasional challenges families face as I felt fortunate in my relationship with my in-laws. It was a comfortable and happy coexistence, a stark contrast to the stories of in-law difficulties I often heard from others. However, an unexpected event soon unfolded that would test the strength of our familial bonds. On the hottest day of the year, a time when heat stroke cases surge, I was at work in the hospital. Amidst the chaos, a patient was rushed in, and to my disbelief, it was my mother-in-law unconscious. Accompanying her was Stephen, looking deeply concerned. This moment marked the beginning of an unforeseen situation that would bring our family even closer together, highlighting the unpredictable nature of life and the importance of cherishing our loved ones. When he arrived home, he found her lying unconscious in the yard. Gardening was not just a hobby for his mother-in-law. It was her passion, filling her outdoor space with an ever-changing array of plants that varied with the seasons. On pleasant days, she loved nothing more than to sip tea outside, surrounded by her green companions. But that day, her dedication to her garden took a toll, and she succumbed to heat exhaustion. Stephen, visibly distressed, pleaded for help for his mother, his face streaked with tears. It was clear how deeply he cared for her. Please, 
We have to help my mom, he implored. Recognizing his anguish, I reassured him everything will be all right. Then I asked if he had informed Russell about the situation. Stephen shook his head. I've tried calling him multiple times, but no answer. Do you know if he's at work today? He's not working today. He was still sleeping when I left this morning, I replied, suggesting that Russell might be unaware of the emergency. I'll reach out to him. Meanwhile, could you handle the hospital admission for your mother-in-law? Absolutely, thank you so much, Stephen said, gratitude in his voice. Thankfully, it turned out that his mother-in-law had only suffered mild dehydration. After receiving some IV fluids, she was alert and could even chat with us, though she still needed to stay in the hospital for a few days for further check. I think I overdid it and just felt weak all of a sudden. I'm sorry for the scare, she apologized to Stephen, who responded with his usual calm, it's nothing to worry about. Finally remembering to call Russell again, I dialed several times until a groggy voice answered, Hello? Russell? You've picked up at last. How much longer were you planning on sleeping? I teased. Russell yawned. Actually, I've been awake and out for a while now, just so you know. It had been ages since I last saw my mother, and the guilt was beginning to weigh on me. To make amends, I decided to treat her to a meal at a luxurious restaurant. When Russell casually mentioned he had done something similar, his words didn't sit right with me. Something felt off, and his lies were too apparent to ignore. Must be nice for her, I remarked, trying to sound convinced yet his claim about her being overly attached struck me as odd. Before he could end the call, I interjected asking if I could speak with my mother-in-law directly. His sudden unease was palpable through the phone and he stuttered out an excuse about her being in the bathroom, promising to relay any message. No worries. I'll just catch up with her myself later, I replied, pressing further. Will you be home early today? His answer was a dismissive no, mentioning a missed call from Stephen that he chose to ignore, thinking it wasn't important. His laughter's lie cutting the call short left a bitter taste. The pieces started to fall into place, confirming my suspicion of Russell's infidelity. His affection for someone else was undeniable, and I couldn't help but wonder who could captivate him so thoroughly that he'd risk everything. Resolved not to let him off easily, I began to craft my plan for retribution. The moment I was certain of his deceit, I took decisive action. I packed up, leaving behind only my wedding ring and a note with a simple warning, be ready. Seeking refuge, I moved into a hotel near my job, starting a new routine that didn't include Russell. My lifestyle was always simple, valuing experiences over possessions, making the transition less burdensome than it might have been for someone else. The clarity of starting anew, albeit under such circumstances, brought a bittersweet sense of liberation. As a geriatric nurse, my income was fairly good, which allowed me to manage my expenses well, especially since I didn't splurge much. My visits to my in-law's place during my days off meant that I wasn't spending excessively. However, since getting married, my ability to save had been compromised for various reasons, leading to some concern about my dwindling savings. Despite this, I had plans to discuss financial adjustments with Russell to recuperate what was lost. The day after I left our shared home, Russell reached out, indicating he must have returned home late. His lack of seriousness towards our situation was evident from his barrage of calls, which I deliberately ignored. When he realized I wasn't responding, he flooded my phone with messages. Initially, his texts were filled with concern, urging me to return and blaming himself for the misunderstanding. However, his tone quickly shifted to aggression, threatening with talk of divorce and demanding alimony, only to switch back to apologies. His erratic messages made me question his emotional stability. Given his increasing desperation, I felt it was the right moment to confront the situation. I had planned a visit to my in-laws the following week, which coincided with the celebration of my mother-in-law's discharge from the hospital after her test showed no significant issues. The family gathered to mark the occasion, and I was thanked for organizing the celebration. I even brought her favorite cake from the bakery she adored 
which brought a joyful smile to her face. During the celebration, my mother-in-law inquired about how I was handling things. I assured her that all the necessary preparations were in place, sharing this with a grin. The atmosphere was warm and pleasant until the doorbell rang. One look at the intercom screen and the change in my mother-in-law's expression told me all I needed to know about the visitor's identity. With a sense of resolve, I invited the person in, ready to face whatever came next. In simpler terms, on a particularly chilly day, as soon as the front door swung open, the person I had been eagerly awaiting arrived. It had been a while since we last saw each other, and there stood Russell, who I had firmly asked to come over because we had serious matters to discuss. I had already filled my mother-in-law in on everything. When I shared with her about Russell's betrayal, she was livid. But I requested her to hold off on any drastic actions, explaining that this was a matter between spouses. She kept apologizing for her son's actions, which, in turn, made me feel unexpectedly guilty. Stella, why didn't you reach out? I've been so worried, Russell exclaimed. Trying to cut through his act, I made it clear that divorce seemed like the only path forward and that I would be seeking financial support. This mention of money suddenly made Russell, who had been somewhat composed until then, question why he should be the one to pay, suggesting instead that I should. This made me question his understanding of the situation, but I knew I needed to remain calm to continue the conversation. The fact is, you cheated! It's only fair that you take responsibility and provide the support, I calmly explained. At this point, my mother-in-law, who'd been quiet, couldn't hold back her frustration any longer. Russell, enough with your nonsense. Just agree to the divorce and provide Stella with the support she's due. And don't you dare show your face here again, or else, she threatened, barely keeping her anger in check. Before she could say something even more extreme, I intervened, urging Russell to feel some sense of shame for the trouble he was causing his family. Here, sign these divorce papers, I said, laying them out in front of him. Russell seemed taken aback, perhaps not fully grasping the gravity of the situation until that moment. He seemed to have hoped for forgiveness, a notion I found astonishing under the circumstances. Why did you come here by yourself? I questioned him. I thought I asked you to bring her along. This story paints a vivid picture of a confrontation filled with tension, disappointment, and the pursuit of accountability. When I gave him a stern look, he hurriedly explained, I did talk to her. She agreed to come, so she's outside in the car right now. My frustration with my husband's hesitant speech was peaking, so I curtly told him, well, then go bring her in. He left and soon returned with a woman who announced herself with an overly cheerful tone that seemed out of place. Hello, everyone, she said with a voice that grated on my nerves, her presence alone filling the room with an awkward energy. This woman having the audacity to burst into her affair partner's family home with such gusto in front of his wife and his mother struck me as overly bold. Hi, it's nice to finally meet you she said to my mother-in-law before turning to me with a smug smile. And Stella, it's been ages. Her laughter felt mocking, hinting at a familiarity that I hadn't expected. Her comment about me being's usual wasn't flattering. It was a dig at her perception of my character, not my looks. Despite her age, she dressed and made herself up in a way that screamed teenage rebellion, a style that clearly didn't match her actual maturity. Really? You think so? She replied after I remarked on her unchanged demeanor. Maybe it's all thanks to my salon. By the way, Stella, have you aged? She scrutinized me, her laughter barely contained. Russell seemed genuinely surprised to see Addison and me interacting, his confusion clear. You two know each other? Yes, we were in the same class in high school. It's been a while since we last met and never would I have imagined it'd be under these circumstances," I explained. Russell, perhaps finding some solace in this revelation, made a hopelessly naive comment. Oh, that's great. So, if you're friends, we can skip the alimony, right? Fantastic news. 
He turned to Addison, affectionately calling her my princess, suggesting he wouldn't need to spend a penny now. I was left speechless by his absurd leap of logic. No, we're not friends, I clarified, appalled he would even use such an endearing term for her. It was a stark reminder of the early days of our own relationship when he used to call me my princess Sarah. A nickname I found so irksome I eventually made him stop using it. The situation was not just uncomfortable but also a bitter reflection of how far we'd veered off course from those early, happier times. The discovery of Russell's betrayal led me straight to a lawyer's office. As the details unfolded it became clear that Addison was the other woman. Addison had a history of pursuing men who were already in relationships, often stirring trouble. Despite not being notably attractive, her self-assured demeanor suggested she saw herself as the most captivating person around. My own disinterest in social media meant I was unaware until a friend mentioned that Addison would boldly reach out to any man who caught her eye, which is apparently how she connected with Russell. Learning Addison worked as a housemaid added an extra layer of disappointment for me. It was disheartening to see Russell entangled with someone like her. Exhausted by the entire ordeal, I pressed Russell to finalize our divorce, to which he surprisingly complied under the false impression that he would escape alimony obligations. Addison's declaration of becoming Russell's pretty wife was particularly unsettling. Her attempt to maintain a youthful demeanor felt out of place and honestly quite embarrassing. Yet, Russell seemed unfazed by her behavior, which made me question his judgment. When Addison tried to win over my mother-in-law with a plea for acceptance, the response was a firm and intimidating no thanks. Addison's dismay at this rejection was palpable, yet she persisted, trying to leverage her supposed friendship with me to gain favor, a strategy that only led to more absurd claims from Russell about fairness. The whole saga was a bizarre mix of misplaced confidence, awkward interactions, and a glaring disregard for the consequences of one's actions, painting a picture of a situation gone wildly off the rails. In the midst of pondering how to deal with the unfolding drama, my brother-in-law, Stephen, walked in. The scene must have looked quite the spectacle because he couldn't help but offer a wry smile, instantly grasping the essence of the chaos before him. Then, out of nowhere, Addison's excitement spiked at the sight of Stephen, as if she'd just stumbled upon a celebrity. Is that Stephen? The brother he talked about? She blurted out, buzzing with an energy all her own. I was puzzled by her reaction, but Stephen calmly greeted her with a long time no see, Addison. It turned out Addison and Stephen had previously worked together at a part time job. Given Stephen's good looks, it wasn't too shocking to learn that Addison had shown interest in him. However, Addison's tenure at that job was cut short due to her poor memory, leading to her dismissal. Amidst this, Addison, perhaps trying to assert some connection, announced with a sway, I'm going to be your new sister-in-law. Are you excited? Stephen's reaction was anything but warm. Seriously? That's the worst, he replied his cool dismissal leaving Addison momentarily speechless. Then, shifting the topic, Stephen brought up a website he'd been shown by a friend, a rather unkind site where users mocked others' social media missteps. Addison was a frequent subject of ridicule there, with comments about her being exhausting and her posts being a joke. Stephen even pulled up one of Addison's social media profiles, filled with selfish that unmistakably identified her as the target of these jabs. Catching Addison's reaction from the corner of my eye, I braced for her to be upset. Yet she brushed it off, claiming, It's hard being popular. Those are just women being jealous. Oh, well, whatever. Despite her nonchalant reply, it was apparent she was trying to mask her disappointment. Her usual vibrancy dimmed. The encounter highlighted the complex web of personal histories, perceptions, and the pain that often lies beneath the surface of bravado. The internet's anonymity often emboldens people to say things they wouldn't dare in person, leading to moments where empathy for those targeted can't help but surface. Despite everything Addison seemed unfazed, 
declaring confidently that she and Russell were destined for a lavish lifestyle. Her proclamation was so far from reality that I couldn't contain my laughter. A glamorous life? That's hard to believe, I chaffled. Only for Addison to snap back, questioning my own situation with a misplaced sense of superiority. The room erupted into laughter again when Addison insinuated that Russell was a doctor. The confusion was priceless. The laughter intensified when it became clear that Addison had misunderstood a social media post. Russell had shared a photo of the hospital where I work with a caption implying hard work, which Addison mistakenly thought referred to him. The leap from seeing a hospital to assuming one is a doctor was amusingly naive. But as Addison rambled on about Russell's generosity, citing expensive dinners and spa treatments, a sense of unease settled in. Her narrative didn't match up with our financial reality. When pressed, Russell's shocking admission that he had used my credit card without permission revealed the depth of his deceit. Using someone else's credit card, family or not, crosses a legal boundary, a fact that seemed lost on him in the moment. Russell's attempt to justify his actions by showing me the family card we had gotten together, part of a promotional campaign for bonus points, was a weak attempt to brush off his misuse of our finances. This revelation not only highlighted his irresponsible handling of money, but also cast a shadow on Addison's fantasies of a luxurious life together, underpinning the entire situation with a layer of irony and misplaced expectations. Navigating our financial landscape became even more complex when Russell made a surprising admission. He confessed to not using his own money for recent lavish expenditures, hinting that the funds must have come from his account. I reminded him, with a forced smile, of his severance pay from his last job, suggesting he should manage it with that. My comment seemed to drain the color from his face. Russell had once held a respectable position in a reputable company, where his hard work and leadership were acknowledged. Yet, after we married, he chose to leave his job, claiming my career as a geriatric nurse, which included night shifts and occasionally outlearning him, wounded his pride. He would often justify not working by saying my income was sufficient for us both. While he did contribute by taking care of household chores, the financial burden of covering all our living expenses on my salary alone was overwhelming, leaving no room for savings. Avoidance became a strategy for Russell, especially regarding visits to my mother-in-law's house, likely to escape conversations about his employment status. Despite my hopes, the prospect of him securing a stable job seemed increasingly unlikely. In a turn of events, Russell excitedly shared that he had found employment, albeit part-time at an assistant manager, where he quickly advanced to a team leader position. Addison's reaction to this revelation was one of disbelief and disillusionment. Muttering to herself, she eventually stood, accused Russell of deceit, and stormed out in a flurry of indignation and hurt, leaving a tense silence in her wake. In that quiet, Russell, seemingly oblivious to the gravity of the situation, suggested we should move past the drama and continue as before. His attempt to reconcile, marked by a clumsy gesture of affection, left me stunned by his lack of awareness and the complexity of emotions swirling through the aftermath of these revelations and confrontations. In a moment straight out of a movie, my brother-in-law, Stephen, who used to be the captain of his judo team, executed a flawless judo throw on Russell. My mother-in-law's cheers of admiration for the move made it hard for me to keep a straight face, especially seeing Russell, who supposedly knew judo, look utterly baffled and outmatched. This incident was a turning point, leading me to swiftly file for divorce. Thankfully, the alimony came from a term deposit Russell had, which matured well before our marriage. He tried to approach me at work post-divorce, looking rather sorry for himself, but a firm warning about involving the police kept him away for good. The thought of pursuing legal action against Addison crossed my mind, given her involvement, but I realized it wasn't worth the effort. She seemed destined for a tough road ahead, a point confirmed during a talk with my lawyer, who mentioned Addison's widespread entanglements and predicted inevitable consequences for her actions. True to the lawyer's words, a friend soon showed me a viral video capturing a crowd of people, 
including Russell demanding justice and repayment from Addison at her residence. The scene escalated to the point where police intervention was necessary, highlighting the extent of her deceit and confirming my decision to leave Russell was sound. Despite the end of my marriage, I maintained a surprisingly amiable relationship with my former mother-in-law, with whom I occasionally meet for meals. The bond we formed seemed to transcend the dissolution of my marriage. Adding a positive twist to the tale, Stephen announced his engagement to his longtime girlfriend, a relationship that had flourished since high school. His successful career move and the invitation to his wedding were testaments to the kind of person he was diligent and caring, starkly different from Russell. This contrast gave me hope for the future and reassured me that not all ties formed through committed myself to continue thriving in my nursing career. Proud of the resilience and growth I'd shown through these trials.